on now to looking at um, sorting, supporting our patients in the metastatic HER2 setting. Um, you know, the historical perspective here, again, has continued to involve, particularly in the last six months. Um, what we have seen is the introduction of a lot of new therapies. Um, but let's go back to, you know, between 20 to 30% of our patients uh, with early stage breast cancer will go on to develop metastatic disease. Um, while we know metastatic disease is now highly treatable um, and is, you know, prolonging um, survival, um, unfortunately it cannot be cured. And this is, you know, um, a non-curative setting. Our five-year survival rates uh, for stage four sits in around the 22%, and our median survival is three years. Now, I'm sure all of you have experience with patients that range from, unfortunately, less than three years to I recently have, I have an 18-year 18, 18 survivor mm -hmm. who is doing fabulously um, on her therapy. And I recently, unfortunately, had the passing of one of my 20-year patients who'd even had a stem cell transplant back in the day. So we've all got a lot of experience with these, these patients. Um, you know, what support tools and resources do we use in our institutions? What sort of uh, experiences are you having particularly in this area looking after metastatic patients, if anyone would like to give me an idea, thanks. Sure. Um, Alahi, let's start with you and then um, Lloyd will hear your perspective as well. Um, you know, as, as you were talking about the trajectory of HER2 positive disease and, you know, where we were in 1998 with our, just the trastuzumab and then adding, you know, your inhibitors to this equation, which is your lopatinib, your noratinib and your tricatinib now, um, and then moving on to this antibody conjugate, um, and now a new era for adding immunotherapy to this. So I think that this is an evolving and fast evolving process. I first started taking care of just specific breast cancer patients back in 2008. Even for the past decade, things have significantly <clears throat> changed, which is great. Um, the way that Dana Farber um, support breast cancer patients, especially in metastatic settings, we have a program named EMBRACE program, which basically stands for Ending Metastatic Breast Cancer Patient for Everyone. And um, anybody who enters um, Dana-Farber, whether it is just a reconsult or new consult, they go and they participate in this program. This program involves uh, taking blood specimen, um, as well as tissue specimen. And um, beside all of this, it has an educational perspective for all metastatic patients. So we have webinars, we have um, newsletters that go out and they talk about every aspect of metastatic disease, the entire trajectory and until the end of life as well. Uh, we also involve um, nutritionist as well as social worker, because that's another aspect that we always forget, just because you do have a metastatic disease doesn't mean that you don't want to know about nutritional status. Um, so um, it is a nice program. It's very evolving. And I have to say patient satisfaction is um, an absolute. The other benefit of this, I believe, is more related to being a bridge um, from, you know, Dana Farber, university-based um, treatment center to um, taking it um, to an outside facility. And I think that's bridge is um, very much interesting because they can actually communicate with local oncologists and update them with any uh, personalized aspect of the treatment plan that can come up from the uh, program. Thank you, Alavia. Yeah. Nicely described the, the years of change that we've seen through um, her to therapy um, to include a variety of different modalities of administration and, um, and targeting. Um, Lloyd, I'm wondering if you can sort of expand a little, a little bit further for us. Um, what are some of the challenges that your patients are facing in the metastatic setting? And, you know, and how, do you endure, um, how do you educate and um, get your patients to adhere maybe some, to some of the 
newer oral therapies that we're now seeing coming out as well. Thank you. Yes, so I think one of the challenges, and we probably have experienced this when patients are diagnosed with metastatic disease, either with the novel metastatic disease or, you know, after a primary diagnosis of breast cancer, uh, there is a big uh, mental health impact that occurs in our institution actually has a team of health psychologists that work at the Carbon Cancer Center to provide and connect these patients to provide them with the extra support for mental health. And they are exactly the what you were mentioning, that bridge between us, the clinician, and not only seeing lab numbers or images or treatment, we're also looking at the patient in a more cohesive way and addressing their mental health because we all know that cancer diagnosis alone, but whenever we're talking about metastatic disease of incurable nature, patients experience a lot of distress and many different ways of distress, but mental distress is one of them. So I think that's very important. And along with the health psychologist and the diarist or dietitian and social worker that Elahi was mentioning, we also have, uh, we work very, very closely with our palliative care team because a lot of our patients with metastatic disease require more uh, intense management of their symptoms, either with or without treatment. So we rely a lot in our colleagues from the palliative care team at our institution to make this more proactive plan for um, symptom control. And I think it's a really good way because the patients do feel supported. They do not feel isolated because they have more than one team that is actually communicating and elaborating this care plan for them as well along with them too. So I think one of the challenges besides, another of the challenges besides the health and mental health impact that we have uh, are the economics, uh, the financial issue, the financial toxicity that a lot of patients with metastatic disease experience. And I think this is very tied with a certain you know, disadvantaged populations, uh, ethnic minorities do, who do not have insurance that, you know, are able to cover a lot of this expensive treatments for a second, third line of treatment. And it, it just becomes an extra added stress for them because it's either I do not have insurance to cover this treatment or the other avenues I do not think and then I could potentially shorten my life because you know, even if it's for 12, 24 months or less than that because I am just simply unable to have a certain treatment. So I think those two are very important barriers that we encounter in the management of our patient with metastatic disease. Yes, I think that they're really key points and I really appreciate you bringing up mental health. Um, I unfortunately think we don't do this very well. I can definitely say, you know, we do have services available definitely at UCLA. However, I think, you know, we could be doing a better job of addressing the long-term issues associated with mental health. And particularly now, I'm sure a lot of you um, are having conversations with your patients, particularly about not only dealing with, you know, a, a terminal illness as such, even though it's, you know, life, we have a lot of therapies available, but added to that stressor now is COVID and you know, the impact on their family um, being around and those sorts of things. So I think that was really great for you to, um, to address. I also like the fact that you work with palliative care. I have to say that's something that we also do is I have an embedded palliative care specialist nurse with us. And, you know, any as soon as someone is metastatic diagnosis, we do go through goal setting, advanced care planning, um, even though, yes, we can promote a long length of life, you know, we do need to address that inevitably one day you may succumb to the disease. Um, so I, I appreciate you discussing that as well. Um, what I would like to also now move on to is, you know, the plethora of new therapies that have been FDA approved in the last six months. Um, you know, and these are for particularly for our patients in the third line setting. Now, traditionally, obviously, we are using um, a taxane, receptor, progeta, plus or minus an anthracycline. And then um, your second line is the trastuzumab um, or TDM1, gosh, trastuzumab and tanzine. <laughs> um, 
And then, you know, in the third line, what are we going to do? And, you know, with the development of, or the FDA approval of Trastuzumab, Deruxtecan, the Tucatinib, um, and Neratinib, you know, what are you doing in your next line of setting? Um, with no clear guidelines, I'd love to hear each of your perspective on what you and your institution are doing. Um, maybe we could start with Susan and hear about what your thoughts are. Well, I think it's exciting to have these new drugs, first of all, um, yeah. as an option for people with progressing HER2 metastatic breast cancer, particularly with brain med. Um, most of our patients are heavily pretreated patients. Um, and so I guess following a guideline, it's usually after two or more lines of therapy when we introduce the uh, Dracatinib. Um, and so far, as an example, we've had a patient that had 10, you know, she's been on 10 cycles already. Um, and so, and she's had very good quality of life, nice control of her metastatic disease. So it's an encouraging drug um, for these particular patients. Um, I think um, as far as educating them for the side effects, that can occur is, is very important, um, particularly the ILD, interstitial, um, um, interstitial disease and pneumonitis. Um, so certainly, you know, having a comp comprehensive education with them prior to starting and going over the side effects. Um, I mean, those, those are, you know, mostly just going over the pulmonary toxicities that can occur and, and then how we would manage that. Okay. And um, Lloyd, would you like to sort of discuss your experiences, um, particularly also looking at uh, uh, trastuzumab, deruxtecan, and jacatinib and aratinib? Sure, absolutely, thank you. Um, I think, again, it's doing pretty much what it's um, very tailored to a specific patient, right, in their situation. And uh, I think we all have encountered those uh, moments where due to the specific, you know, one, two, three guideline, we kind of have to look at the overall picture. And for example, I, I have a patient um, who has metastatic disease but um, due to patient's decision does not want any sort of images, right? So uh, for us, it's kind of, okay, well, we are not certain if there is some CNS involvement yet. We probably, you know, are kind of in this. So it's probably a patient who I will not go straight to, you know, use uh, to catinib, right? So I will, and I started that patient or I found this patient on famtrastuzumab deruxtecan and actually had initially good response to treatment, right? And we are kind of following only with symptoms, right? But I have had other patients that also have metastatic disease and have CNS involvement. And those probably knowing the data that we know now recently with the cat to name is somebody that I will go with this regimen for third line versus going to, you know, Fantastuzumab to can. Um, likewise, we have had patients who have had treatment you know, with TCHP in the new adjuvant setting, eventually going into, you know, developing metastatic disease who had a very intense time with a symptom management of the diarrhea, right, and, and TCHP. Probably this would be somebody that I will think twice before going into a treatment based with neurotinib just because of we know how much diarrhea, you know, can occur in grade three and four with knowing that 94% of the patients did develop some sort of diarrhea with a, more than half of those grade three diarrhea, right? Which is one of the main side effects why treatment with neurotinib had to be discontinued. So again, um, I think it's very tailored to the patient's needs and what we're trying to target and what we're achieving, right? How taking into account patient's age, patient's, you know, um, goals, what they want to, uh, I think it's a very important quality of life and making sure that any treatment that we choose, we have to be on top of symptom management to hopefully be able 
to have the patient achieve, you know, some sort of good response on it, right? Great, thank you very much, Lloyda. Um, Alahi, could you give us your experience, obviously, with deciding third-line therapies? And also maybe, when would you consider maybe adding in a clinical trial, if that was an option? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So um, we much pretty much the same as uh, we all discussed. We tend to go to, you know, um, to catnip mostly when we have refactory um, CNS involvement with progression of disease on current regimen. So it is one of our third line. I mean, um, trastuzumab, duroxepan is our third line therapy as well, but we tend to go to tacatinib if we do actually see more progression of the CNS involvement. Mm -hmm. um, as for lepadinib and uh, capsidabine, that's another of our third line therapy um, that we do offer patients as well. And again, it depends on what they have done before um, and how they can actually manage their side effects. Um, as for, um, I'm sorry, what was the second part of your question? I was also saying, when would you consider using a clinical trial as your third line therapy? Clinical trials at Dana-Farber is an ongoing process. So um, we tend to bring clinical trial um, quite often, uh, mostly during our third um, line of uh, treatment, but sometimes really on the second, if we don't really have any good options for our patients, but mostly the third plus line, we do uh, bring our clinical trials in. Great. Um, and I'm sure that is also happening with um, the other institutions as well is, you know, because we don't have a definitive third line setting, you know, could is the thought to add in a clinical trial that does give us another level of therapy, whereas eventually we may end up using the trastuzumab, deruxtecan, tucatinib, neratinib, lapatinib. I mean, we've just explored a whole line of third line options um, that a clinical trial may also add to that. Um, do Susan or Lloyda have any further um, perspective on the use of the clinical trials? I would say at our institution, that is something that we probably would go to first, actually. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Just screen for eligibility for a clinical trial mm -hmm. for most patients. And Lloyd, so, what about you? Yeah, so at the University of Wisconsin, we are an uh, academic institution as well. So there are always ongoing clinical trials. And we tried to screen patients too and see if they are eligible for any of the trials that they currently have open as well, if they will potentially qualify for them. And also another potential consideration for clinical trials as well is like you were mentioning, whenever we are running out of options, we have gone through second, third lines and then we're not longer having any. We look into phase one clinical trials trials as well. Uh, that's another option that we have. Uh, or, you know, surrounding collaborating academic institutions so that may have something. So uh, I think, again, we, we try to look at different avenues for what best, you know, the outcome will be hopefully for patients and what will be more helpful for them. Yes, I think that's absolutely correct. Is we aren't, at, we are not acting individually with our institutions. A lot of us, particularly even here on the West Coast, is you know, we do interact with our local um, other uh, tertiary institutions and looking at um, optional clinical trials. So I think that's a really good point as well. 